Getting better. I want to yeah. say that Doug has on the Cleveland t-shirt. Yeah, stand up. Stand up, Doug. <laughs> We're taking up. <clears throat> if anybody has any extra shirt that they would lend uh, <laughs> to, cover, <clears throat> you, honey, to, cover, to cover himself. I said, someday <clears throat> they're going to be good. Yeah. <laughs> Bob believed that for years, didn't you, Bob? <laughs> yeah. Are we good? Okay, praise the Lord. I'm starting a message entitled To Judge or Not to Judge. Uh, should we judge? A lot of people think, let me show you Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. And we'll just look at this quick. <clears throat> We're going to go here in context, by the way. You know, we are always judging. Do you know that? Or discerning? Amen. I mean, if you look at a road and it's flooded, right? You're, you're, you're making a judgment call. I'm not going to go down that road. Most of you are judging me right now. You're thinking, man... That dude's got to be on steroids. <laughs> I bet he works out 24-7. Right, Emerson? That's it. Yeah, that's what he... <laughs> of course, I'm joking, but you know, we, we all, we do, we're constantly making judgment calls. So people that say, well, you're not supposed to judge, there's a right judgment and a wrong judgment. Amen? And we're going to talk about that. And, and the first person we need to judge, well, this is going to be my first point, I'm going to elaborate on it, is ourself. The Lord spoke to me this morning and said, the taproot of self-righteousness is to judge other people while never judging yourself. Amen. That is the taproot. If I start judging people, but I don't judge myself and make sure I'm in relationship with God, and this isn't a judgment like oh, I've got to keep all the rules. It isn't that. But anyhow, let's just start. Matthew chapter 7, verse 1 says, judge not that you be not judged. Now, most people know that verse. You can't judge me. You can't judge me. They know that one. I think it's 1 Timothy 5, 23. Drink no longer water, but drink a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. <laughs> Just the drink a little wine part. Those are the two they know, right? That's it, <laughs> right? Right, and they put those two together and that's say, hey, that's right. You can't judge me. Listen, we have to judge. But the key is how we judge. And discern. Let me show you uh, John chapter 7. First of all, let's just, yeah, John 7, 24. Let me show you that one. Watch this one. I think it's John 7, 24. <clears throat> Jesus said, judge not according to the appearance, but judge a righteous judgment. Amen? How many times have we judged something just by the way it looked, only to find out that that was not an accurate judgment? Right? So he's telling you to judge, but don't just judge according to appearance. Judge a righteous judgment. So God has called us to judge. It's just how we judge that matters. Amen? With that said, let me say, number one, the first place we, the first judgment that needs to occur in our life, if I could have 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5 from the Amplified Bible. I'm going to show it to you from the Amplified Bible. The first one that needs to be judged according to the Word of God is myself. Now, this isn't a judgment of condemnation and I feel this. Listen, I need to judge to make sure I'm in line with Jesus Christ and all that he's done. Amen? Amen. See, there's this crazy, insane, perverted, demonically inspired, fleshly idea that if you're under grace, you just, you're just free to let your flesh go wild. That is not grace. That is what Jude warned of in Jude verse 3, one chapter in Jude. He said, when I gave all dil Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation... It was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you would earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in, verse 4, certain men who have crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness or licentiousness or to unbridled lust, even denying or saying no to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? So he said, man, Jude's just basically saying, I wanted to write to you about the good things of God, but it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you to contend for the faith. I'll tell you, false doctrine is what kills the body of Christ. The devil so desperately wants you and I to believe wrong, because if we believe wrong, we'll live wrong. I was listening to my wife and I were listening to what Pastor Dwayne Sheriff last night on the... Uh, on a DVD from the minister's conference I came from, and he was talking about marriage. And he was talking about the purpose of marriage. He goes, most people don't know the purpose of marriage. 
He said they don't. They don't understand why God created marriage. And when you, when, Miles Monroe used to say, where purpose is not known, abuse is inevitable. When you don't know the purpose of something, if you believe that that guitar was, was made to hammer in a nail and you start using that guitar to hammer in a nail, how many of you know that's not the purpose of the guitar? Yeah. Right? right. And, and, and when you violate the purpose, you're going to do damage to the instrument. When we don't understand the purpose of marriage, and one of the things he said, this is what I'm after, is that in Ephesians 5, it talks about that uh, man and a wife and it says, uh, in a marriage relationship and it says at the end the second last verse I believe it's verse 32 this is a great mystery but I speak concerning Christ in the church in other words if marriage is messed up people will have trouble seeing God through our marriages amen, amen. so so if, if we don't understand those things then the enemy gets in and then we then we put a bushel over our light and people can't see one of, the, one of the things, it's not the only thing that God designed marriage for, was to show the world what a relationship with Him would look like. Read Ephesians 5. Read it all the way down. And He said, this is a great mystery, but I'm talking about Christ in the church. And then the next verse, He says, nevertheless, and I'm paraphrasing, it applies to marriage also, but I'm really trying to give the world a picture of what a relationship with God looks like, a healthy relationship. And one of the ways I do that is through the marriage covenant, there's that word again. Amen. So the first person we're to judge is ourself. Examine and test and evaluate your own selves. Wow. <laughs> Not to make sure I'm keeping a bunch of rules, but to make sure my faith is in Jesus. Amen. Right? Amen. See, religion has made this all where, oh, I didn't do this right and I thought this wrong. Boy, that'll tear you up. He said, just make sure, this is why we take communion, I'll get into that in a little bit, is to make sure our faith is in Jesus and not in us. <coughs> Good or bad. Amen? Now look at this. Examine and test and evaluate your own selves to see whether you are holding to your faith and showing the proper fruits of it. I like to say it like this. What the fruit in my life is an indicator of what my heart believes. Amen? The fruit in my life I, or here's, here's an example. I've used this before and it's powerful. If me and I are walking down a hallway and we're coming like this towards each other and I'm holding a cup of coffee and you bump into me, guess what's coming, going to be all over you? Not soda pop, not water, coffee. Why? Because that's what's in my cup. Amen? And a lot of times in our relationship with God, what we've been feeding on, what we've been, the reason people are grumpy is because they're empty of the life of God. Not in their spirit, but in their soul. Amen. Amen. That's why we're commanded to be full of God. See, the world's made it about, and the church many times has made it about keeping rules. It isn't about keeping rules. It's about being full of God. Now look at this. Examine and test and evaluate your own selves to see whether you're holding to your faith. Faith in who? You or him? Yeah. Him. Make sure you're holding to your faith. That, see, this is why it's good news. It's about him. Yeah. Make sure you're holding to your faith and showing the proper fruits of it. Test and prove yourselves, not Christ. Do you not yourselves realize and know through an ever-increasing experience? Boy, I want to come back to that. That Jesus Christ is in you unless you are counterfeits, disapproved on trial and rejected. Through an ever, we're to know, through an ever-increasing experience. I like to say it like this, and I've said it. If you don't focus on what you believe, and if you don't grow in it, you will lose it. Amen. You will lose it. People don't, oh, no. Let me show it to you. King James, Mark, no, tell you what, amplified. Mark chapter 4, verse 24, I think. Watch this. Mark 4, verse 24. And he said, Be careful what you are hearing. The measure of thought and study you give to the truth you hear will be the measure of virtue and knowledge that comes back to you. You didn't earn it. You just learned it. Right? Right? You didn't earn it, but the measure I give to it is the measure that comes back to me. Can I give you guys a little clue? This is a little hint. There is no other way but being a fanatic. There isn't. Some people, well, I, I don't, I'm not saying being a weirdo. See, we, we equate fanatic and weirdo are two completely different things. Come on. <laughs> being a fanatic means you really believe it. Let me, I'll tell you who's fanatics. These people that paint themselves up for football games. 
and they wear these monster costumes, and I think, you're weird, over a football game. I mean, root for your team, yes, but... Ah! <laughs> I'm in the zone, <laughs> you know, right? That's weird. But being, being intense, being, even believing what you believe. Guys, I, you're an alien, is what Peter says in 1 Peter. You're not of this world. Amen. 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 No, 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 no. I'm not talking about that. <laughs> I'm not talking about that. But you're not, you're, you're, you operate on a different system. A system of blessing. No matter what's going on out here. That's why Paul could be thrown in jail and, and still be blessed. Still be praising God because he's not of this world. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Well, anyhow, so the measure of, of, of virtue and knowledge, that's the measure that comes back to you. More besides will be given to you. King James, next verse, if I could have that, please. I know I'm making you. For he that hath, hath what? Understanding. He that has understanding to him shall be given. And he that hath not understanding from him shall be taken away even that which he has do you see it to the person that has and gives to what they have and grows in their relationship with God and their understanding of what Jesus has done more is given <clears throat> but to him now look at this but and he that hath not understanding doesn't receive that from him shall be taken away even what he has Truth is, he's already got it. But you lose it if you don't use it. If you don't grow in it. Powerful stuff, guys. See, God's not the variable here. Amen. Amen. So is it right to judge? The first person we need to judge is our self. We need to judge ourself. Am I believing on or into Jesus? Yes or no? John chapter 6, verse 28. John 6, verse 28. Watch this. Most of you have heard me quote this, but then said they unto him, Jesus. They're talking to Jesus, the disciples. What shall we do? What shall we do? That's what everybody wants to know. What shall I do, right? What shall I do? What shall we do that we might work the works of God? That's a great question, right? We got to go to seminary or cemetery or whatever you want to call it. You got to do all these things, right? No, here, here it is. Next verse he tells you. Jesus answered and said unto them, this is the work of God. The singular work. Here it is, guys. Mm -hmm. This is what we need to judge ourselves. And if I'm truly believing, well, let me finish it. This is the singular work of God, that you believe on Him. The Greek says into Him. E-I-S in Greek. And that's the English spelling, right? And it means motion into Him. It's a process. This is the work singular of God that you believe into him whom he has sent. Who is that? Jesus. Well, I do believe in God. The devils believe and tremble. Amen? See, many people have devil faith. What do you mean by devil faith? They operate with devil faith. They believe but we're terrified that God isn't who he says he is. And the only way, see, this is the work. This is what you're doing today. You're working. To believe into Him. You're laboring to rest, Hebrews 4.11. That's work. Because it doesn't happen naturally. It takes effort. That's not a cuss word. It's spirit-empowered effort. Amen. Amen. <laughs> See, there's people teaching all kinds of stuff and calling it grace. Well, you're under grace, you just kick back and drink lattes. How's that working for you when you get attacked with something? Amen. And you will. You're in a broken world. I'm not trying to speak bad. I'm just saying things come against you in this world. That's right. And that's why people are, they get offended. They're really offended at God. They blame people, but the offense, the deep, the root of it is the offense is at God. God let me down. God never let me down and he never lets you down yeah. and he never will. That's right. Amen. But see, your heart's got to be convinced of that. Your heart's got to know that's true. That's why it says this is the work of God. It's work. You got to believe in Him, but guess what? You got a lot of help. You got the Holy Ghost living on the inside of you, and He's there to help you. But it's going to take some effort on your part. Let me tell you something that I'm learning 
And I call it, I call it the power of a prayer partner. There's something about being together. I know that, oh, bless God, I don't have to go to church. We are the church. I got it. You, your church, the goldfish is the church. Everything's the church. I got it. I get that. But, that's, but if you look up the word church, Thayer's definition literally talks about being called out from the homes into the public assembly. There's something about being around other people and being strengthened with other believers. Amen. I've noticed this with, with my friend Ramin out in Southern California. I noticed that him and I will pray together. Linda's been doing it too. Just We call, we just start praying. We will pray for great lengths of time, praying in the Holy Ghost, and just having him or her on the other end and just hearing them pray. You got to go, you just hang up. Does something for me. I'm praying more now than ever. You guys are so blessed because I'm praying in the Holy Ghost for you. He knows perfectly how to pray for you. All I have to do is be a vessel, but I'm getting so encouraged. It's like jogging. When you jog with somebody... They can, that can help you. There's something about numbers, guys. There's something about numbers. I don't know what it all is. But see, the enemy attacks unity. Because if you get away from the body of Christ, you become idealistic. And, and if, boy, if people were just as spiritual as me, they could hear what I'm trying to say. No, we need each other. And boy, am I seeing it. And this has taught me so much the power of unity. I see that number come up and I pull up my phone and I look, I put on speakerphone or Linda, whatever, and I hear, we walk around, I walk around here zillions of times, well, maybe not that many times, <laughs> lots of times, all right? Praying in the Spirit. And then we pray in the understanding because we're getting the mind of Christ as how to pray in the understanding. Amen. Praise God. So the first person <clears throat> that we need to judge is ourselves. We need to make sure that our faith is in Him and not in us. Let me show you this. i got to say something about the blood of Jesus. Here's another attack that's coming. In, that's not coming. It's here in the body of Christ. And, 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 and this is what... Make sure your faith is in His blood, not yours. Amen? Amen. 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 We talked about out of Romans 3.25 about faith in His blood. But I want to show you this out of Romans chapter uh, 5 verse... I don't even know what I'm doing now. <laughs> Romans chapter 5 verses... Well, I forgot. I wrote it down, didn't I? Romans chapter 5, ver, uh, 3 verse 25. That's what I want. Go to 3 verse 25. I want to say this about the blood. 5, 9. That's what I'm after. Thank you, Jesus. 5, 8. Man, I got so many Romans verses in my brain. 5, 8. I want to do 8 first. They call that brain gas, don't they? <laughs> I was nice. But God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The word commendeth means he demonstrated his love toward us. Some translations say that. I think the New King James says that. God demonstrates his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In other words, God didn't wait <clears throat> till we had it all together. That's right. Thank he died for us <clears throat> in, in, as sinners. Next verse. <clears throat> oh, I love this. Oh, I love this. Much more. Much more. Then, let me, let me say this to you. If, if the enemy can get your faith out of the blood of Jesus and into something else, into your performance, and I'm telling you, people are teaching this in the name of grace. They're teaching that God did not require a sacrifice, that that bloody stuff is just, it's archaic, it's old-fashioned, it doesn't fit. People are trying to make God into their image. I did a, I did a post this week called, Heresy is nothing more than man trying to conform God to his image. I don't have to understand it to believe it. God required blood. Amen. All throughout the Old Testament, the Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Hebrews 9.22, the word remission means freedom from sin. But if they can get you out, oh, it's just this grace and God just overpowers you. We talked about why Esau, he sought repentance when he sold his birthright. He sought it with tears, but he found no place of repentance. Why? Because he sought it with his emotion. He sought it with, oh God, if you're good, just change your mind. He didn't seek it through a blood sacrifice. There's nothing outside of the blood. Outside the blood. I'm telling you, Peter calls it the precious blood of Jesus. And I'll tell you what, you lay there at night and you think, man, I am justified. That word justified means made righteous. Without the blood, you're not righteous. <laughs> you're a sinner. Wait till we get into the five Old Testament sacrifices. Blood. 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 
We're righteous by the precious shed blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, is, His blood is sinless. And guys, put faith in His blood. Now watch this. Much more being now made righteous, justified by His blood. By the blood His, the Greek says, we shall be saved, delivered, protected from the wrath through Him. We shall be saved from judgment through Him. I believe, I tell my, every night I put my hands on my kids and I say, I call the blood of Jesus over you. There's people now say, oh, you don't plead the blood. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's, that's too, oh. you know what I, well, you know what a lot of people are doing? Can I tell you what they're doing? Shock preaching. They try to say these shocking statements. So you're like, Jesus did not die for you. It's a lie. He died as you. Ooh. <laughs> I'd love to just slap some of these people. I would. I know what Andrew means when he says that spirit of slap comes all over you. Jesus died for me. I didn't shed my blood for him. It wasn't my blood. It was his. Hallelujah. Yes, he died in my place and God sees me in him when I receive him. Oh, no, he died for all mankind. I'm getting on a soapbox. I'm trying to stop. But let me show you Romans 16, 7. Well, all men were in Christ, right? You'll hear that preached. Wrong. 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 Mm. <laughs> Romans 16. Look, salute Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners who are of note among the apostles who also were in Christ before me. Can you see it? Amen. You're not in Christ until you receive Jesus. Amen. Lies from hell masquerading as grace. They're satanic lies. They're evil. And they'll rob you of faith in the blood. And you'll start looking to your grave. See, that's what Gnosticism is. Gnostic means knowledge. It's the deification of one's intellect. I'm so small. All right, so we need to judge ourselves. Make sure our faith is in Him, that it's in the blood of Christ. One more on self-judgment. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23. We've talked about this, but I want you to see it. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. Oh, doing good. For I received of the Lord, this is Paul talking, that also which I delivered unto you, that the same that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. Next verse. Next verse. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of your performance. No, do it in remembrance of me. Next verse. After the same manner also, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This is the New Testament or the New Covenant in my blood. This do ye as often or as oft as you drink it, in remembrance of me. That's the purpose of the communion table. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he comes. Next verse. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily. Now, we've talked about this before. What does unworthily mean? Does it mean he's not worthy? In and of ourselves, none of us are worthy. He made us worthy. This is an adverb, not an adjective. Adjective would be descriptive of the person. An adverb means is descriptive of the action. How do you take it unworthily? You do it in remembrance of you and not of him. Amen. You start looking at yourself and your performance instead of him and his finished perfect work. Can you see that? That's how you take it in remembrance. You, that's how you take it unworthily. You don't look at what he did. See, you need this is... That taking the communion is an act of judging yourself to make sure your faith is in Him and not in you. Amen. When I feel like I've blown it, I take communion. When I feel like I'm doing good, I'll run to the communion table and remind myself, it's not about me good, it's not about me bad, it's about Jesus perfect. Amen. And I'm in Him, and God sees perfection. It's His body that was broken that I might be healed. It's His blood that removed all sin in my life. Amen. Even if I've just blown it big, it's about Him. About him. See, that's what this is. This is a judgment. I'll show you that. For whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily, not looking at what I've done, but looking at what he's doing or not doing, shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Which this means is that he won't receive what the body and blood of the Lord has made available, even though it's his. Make any sense? Next verse. For let a man examine himself, judge himself. Watch this. 
And so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. In other words, when you take the communion table, judge yourself. Make sure you're not looking at you. Make sure you're looking at the cross and what Jesus did. Amen. Amen. Can you see that? That's what you're to examine yourself of. This is to be an act of self-judgment. But see, we think of self-judgment as, well. Oh, man, I did this wrong. I didn't do that right. I did this wrong. See, that's it. That's craziness. The only judgment we're to do is to make sure our faith is in Him. The only way you can take the communion table unworthily as a believer is to believe you're unworthy. Can you hear that? If you believe you're unworthy, then you're not, you're, you're not receiving what Jesus did. He made you worthy, man. <laughs> examine yourself. Make sure you're looking at Him. But let a man examine, judge himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Next verse. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, not looking at what Jesus did, he eats and drinks condemnation, O King James, damnation, to himself, or judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body, not discerning that it's about Jesus. See, this is what faith is. Next verse. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Among you, he's talking about the body of Christ. For this cause, people don't look at what Jesus did and they just take it as a little cracker and a little piece of juice and they think, oh, that's nice. And they're not realizing that, the, that it represents the body and it represents the blood that was shed for us. Because of that, many don't partake of the benefits they already have made available to them. Many are weak. They're sickly and they die prematurely, not because it's God's will, not because of something they've done, but it's something they haven't done. And that's look at what Jesus did. Amen. 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 Next verse. Watch this. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. If we should judge, we would judge ourselves and make sure we're looking at Jesus and at His perfect sacrifice. We would not fall into the same condemning sentence that the world falls into. <sighs> One more. Maybe. <laughs> For when we are judged, He said to judge ourselves, we are chastened of the Lord. We're trained of the Lord. We come in line with what His Word says. We're child trained of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. How many know there's a judgment on the world? Oh, you get this, you get that. I was with some people, unbelievers. It's been a while. And I was around listening to them talk. My word. I had so much, there was so much unbelief coming. I mean, it was, it was mind boggling. And I'm thinking, Ma, how are you guys even alive? <laughs> I mean, my word, with all this talk of this and getting that and this and that, man, just end it. Get it over with. <laughs> I'm teasing. <laughs> but that's, that's what it made me feel like. And I think people talk like this all the time. All the time. You can't partake of that and have it not affect you. Words are seeds. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. It's not only what you say, it's what you hear. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. So does unbelief. Isaiah 54, verse 17 says, No weapon formed against us shall prosper. Now, it doesn't say it isn't formed against us, but it says it won't prosper. How? Why not? For every tongue that rises up against us in judgment, we have to condemn it. Amen? Amen? People will put stuff on you. Her and I were talking about the in Proverbs it says there is that speaks like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise is health. It might be Proverbs 12, 18 or somewhere around there. It says, there is that speaks like the piercings of a sword. We have noticed people can say stuff to you. Man, it's like a knife. It's like a knife. You feeling all right? You know, you know you've heard that. The guy that went to work feeling great. And all these people come up to him and, and they said, man, are you feeling all right? You're looking pretty rough. And I forget, at noon he went home sick. <laughs> but see, that's the power of words. That's what we got to feed on the Word of God. We got to feed on His faithfulness. And that's in the Word of God. But when we are judged by judging ourselves, am I, is my faith in Jesus or me? We are chastened. We are child trained. We are trained of the Lord that we should not fall under the same condemning sentence as the world. I'm going to say it and I'm going to say it boldly. If everyone in here falls over sick and dead, which they're not going to, God is still a healer. Amen. Amen. 
We don't base it on what happens or doesn't happen. We base it on what God's Word says. That's the standard. Jesus paid the price. And you can't have faith for something that you haven't heard preached. So we're going to preach it. We're going to shout it from the rooftops. We're going to encourage you to grab hold of this. Seize hold upon it. Jesus paid for it. It's yours. Amen. 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 Praise God. <laughs> Praise the Lord of glory. Amen. So we need to judge ourselves. Make sure our faith is in Him and not anywhere else. Where is my faith focused? Number one, uh, that's where the number one thing we need to judge ourselves. Is my faith focused towards Him or towards me? Luke chapter 18, let me show you this one. I did this one last week. I want to do it again because you need to see it. Ah, this is so good. Golly, this is good. Man, it's good. I feel it in my spirit. I feel it. It's so good. God loves you so much. He loves you so much. He's wrapping his arms around you. He's just loving you. Hallelujah. What did I say? Luke 18. 9. Start with 9. I shared this last week. I want you to see this. This is really powerful. And he, he Jesus, spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Once again, you, you, what, a, what is in a person? Uh, uh, if you don't judge yourself and make sure you're in line. See, if you don't realize how much mercy you've received, you're not going to extend mercy to other people. Amen? Amen. Amen? You won't. What did Jesus say in Luke chapter 7? He, he talked about those who, uh, this woman, she's been forgiven much, etc., etc. Those who are forgiven much, they love much. James chapter 2 verse 13. He will have judgment without mercy that has shown no mercy and mercy rejoices or triumphs over judgment. You know, the, one of the things I'm learning in life, we all need mercy. <laughs> Thank God for the mercy and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we have to continue to relate to Him based on that. And see, and this is what, you can, unmerciful people like the Pharisees thought they had it going on. Did you know that? Watch this. And He spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and they despised others. People that trust in themselves are, are despisers of others. Did you know that? When people trust in themselves, they will look down on other people. Yep. Well, if you were just living as good as me. We joke sometimes when we play cards. I know some people believe you can't play cards, but it ain't about do or don't and any of that stuff. But we'll joke when we get a good hand. Oh, you must be living right. <laughs> I think it's hilarious. <laughs> Amen. All right. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Next verse. Two men went up into the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee. Pharisee means that they were religious. They were the separated ones. And the other a publican. Next verse. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. Now this is what rocked my world. The word with there, when the Pharisee prayed, it literally, it's the Greek word pros. It's a preposition. P-R-O-S in English. And it means toward. Toward yourself, or, or one definition says, with regard to himself. He prayed with himself, and then he started, I, I thank you that I'm not like, notice how he prayed. Lord, I thank you that I'm not like everyone else. <laughs> Aren't you something? <laughs> but see, that's, that's self-righteousness. But what I want you to see is the Bible says he prayed toward himself or with regard to himself. And as a result, he despised other men. The other guy, the publican, went so much as, as, look, he smote upon his breast and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Now, before the cross, we're not sinners saved by grace. We're new creations changed by grace. But with that said, we still miss it. Don't look at me in that tone of voice, <laughs> Right? We all have things. We all need mercy. Right? Let me show you. There's, well, let me, let me show you. Um, so, it, number one, is it right to judge? Yes. It's how we judge. Let me show you Luke, or Philippians chapter 1, verse 9, from the New King James, or the Old King James. It doesn't matter, because I'll just address it. We're going to get into how do we judge other people. When I say judge, I'm, use, I, I'm using it interchangeably with the word discern. We don't pass sentence on other people and send them to hell. All right, okay? Everybody got that? But we need to discern. And God, God has called us to discern. 
And this I pray that your love may abound still more. Notice that your what may abound? Love. 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 You know in 1 Corinthians 13, you know one of the characteristics of love, God is love. Love believes the best. I love what Dodie said when she was up here talking about the list. If your name isn't on the list, don't be offended. Don't go there. But you know how many people go there? You know Satan's MO is offense. Offended people pull away from the people that have offended them. I got news for you guys. If you're around me long enough, I'm going to offend you. <laughs> and you're going to offend me. Yeah. Don't nod your head, Rich. <laughs> That's just called life, guys. But what do we need? Mercy. You know how many marriages this would save if people just chose to believe the best instead of the worst? Yep. You know what the enemy will do? Well, they said this. And if you say, yeah, they did, and that really irked me. Well, here's what they meant to say. That's worse yet. I like to say it like this. We judge ourselves by what we, we, we judge other people by what they say and do. We judge ourselves by what we meant to say or do. It's a double standard right out of the gate. See, if, if we're walking in the new covenant and we're walking in grace, well, number one, we need to judge ourselves and make sure our faith is in Jesus. If I'm touchy and offendable, there's something wrong. My, my cup's low. The next thing that we need to do with self-judgment, let me finish this, and this I pray that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and in all discernment. The old King James says judgment. The next thing I need to judge myself of, make sure my focus is on the Word of God, right? Look at the fruits of my life, but watch this. Make sure I'm full of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. See, let me show you this. Genesis chapter 2. I'm going to thank Creflo Dollar for this, but I'm going to start because he shared something this week that rocked my world. He was talking about the prayer language of the Holy Ghost. Imagine that. A grace guy talking about the prayer language of the Holy Ghost. I love it. Love it. It's life changing. Genesis chapter 2. We'll start at verse 10. I'm going to, I'm going to do a quick rundown. The Bible says in Ephesians 5 that we're, we're to understand the will of the Lord. We're not to be drunk. Verse 18. Verse 17, un, be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Verse 18 says, be not drunk with wine, wherein is unsavedness, the Greek says, or excess. And the word literally means unsavedness. You act like an idiot. <laughs> That's my paraphrase. But be filled or cram packed with the Spirit of God. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, right? So God wants us to be cram packed with the Holy Ghost. And it's going to take some effort. The Holy Ghost is there, but how many know so is this dead weight we call a body? How many know it's called a mortal body? How many know in Romans chapter 8, he talks about it's the, I believe it's verse 11, it's that we, the, what quickens this mortal body or makes it go God's way is the Spirit. My friend Ramin says it like this, either, pray, you, either sinning will keep you from praying or praying will keep you from sinning. These are grace guys. Man, there's a revival in prayer. Man, we need to pray. We need to pray. Because God gets in on our prayers. It's called our authority. We need to build ourselves up on our most holy faith. And then when we pray in our English, it'll be powerful. See, too many times the, the, the gray matter that resides between our ears called a brain has been the Lord of my Christian life. That's why even when I go to the Word, you know, I, I tell people this, and I really mean it. I am not interested in my opinion. I have lots of opinions. Most people have many. Kind of like armpits. I'm kidding. <laughs> Usually have a couple and they both, well, moving right along. <laughs> All right. There's, watch this. And a river went out of Eden. You know the word Eden means pleasure? Now, let me show you something. He's talking about the Garden of God. This is before the fall. Now, I want you to jump over to uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 9, and we'll come right back here from the Amplified. I want to show you this. First, I want to just show you. you. You need to see it. First Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9. Watch this. From the Amplified. For we, are, for we are fellow workmen, joint promoters, labors together with and for God. You are God's garden. You are God's garden. You are God's garden. 
You are God's garden. You are God's garden. And vineyard and field under cultivation. You are God's building. Isn't that good? Now watch this. Go back to King James. Genesis chapter 2. <clears throat> verse 10. Who's God's garden? Amen. Now watch this. Genesis chapter 2. And it says, And a river went out of Eden, where Eden means pleasure, to water the garden. Who's God's garden? And from thence it was parted and became four heads. One river becomes rivers. Right? What did Jesus say in John chapter 7? Verse 37, 38 and 39. On that last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man believe on me as the Scripture has said, not as Grandma has said, not as your pastor has said, but as the Scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And it goes on to say, He spake that of the Holy Ghost. At that time, the Holy Ghost wasn't given, but how many know right now He's been given? Amen. Now watch this. It says, And it was parted and became four heads. Rivers. Psalm 46, verse 4. There is a river. The streams or the rivers there of which shall make, make glad the city of God, even the tabernacles of the Most High. There is a river. <laughs> Holy Ghost. Now watch this. And this river became rivers or was parted into four heads. Next verse. The name of the first one was Pison. Pison means increase. Go to the next verse. I'm do, i got to hurry. And the gold, next verse. Pison. Everybody say increase. increase. Next verse. The second river was Gihon. Gihon means bursting forth. So we got increase, bursting forth. Next verse. The third one was Hittikel. Hittikel means rapid. So increase, bursting forth, rapid. And the last one there, the fourth river, was Euphrates, which means fruitfulness. Increase, bursting forth, into rapid fruitfulness. Good deal. <laughs> Good deal. Now, moving right along. This is what I heard Creflo share this week, and it blessed my socks off so much. I'm still chewing on it. I went back and looked at it and meditated on it. It's so powerful. Most people believe, and I had this going on without even knowing it, most people believe that the commandment that God gave in the garden, the first commandment, was don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's not right. That was not the first commandment. <coughs> it was the second commandment. Here was the first commandment. Watch this. Look at verse 15. The first commandment was, And the Lord took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Next verse. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Watch this. Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. The first commandment was of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. Had they ate of the trees of the garden that were available to them, they would have been so full of, of they would have not lusted for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Can you see that now? Now let's, let's so there's the first commandment. Look at the next one. The next verse says, But of the tree, here's the second commandment, of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now, couple this with the Ephesians 5. See, we think it's touch not, taste not, handle not. It's be cram-packed with the Holy Ghost and those things lose their appeal. I'm finding out that the things of this world grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. Everything's better with Jesus in the center. But see, we're trying, oh, you just, oh, you can't do this. Women don't cut their hair. Just come on, and God, no, you can't do this. You got to quit this and start this and don't watch that TV show. Just fall in love with Jesus. Amen. And you'll be so full of God as you partake of, of the tree of life. Can you partake of the tree of life? Does a snake have hips? Does a chicken have lips? Look at, look at Proverbs 15.4. Watch this. Watch Proverbs 15.4. If we would eat of the, of, the, of the tree of life, a wholesome tongue, verse 4, that's good though too. Proverbs 15, 4 says that wholesome tongue is a tree of life. Look at this. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness therein, wherein? The tongue. The tongue is a breach or a break from your born again spirit. Now you know why on the day of Pentecost, it's called the promise of the Father. When God could have given them anything, He came with a language from heaven and said, i got to get their tongue because death and life are in the power of the tongue. Amen. Amen. 
A wholesome tongue, that's, that word wholesome is the Greek word marpe. Marpe means a healed tongue. It's the same word that's used in... in uh, get that for me, would you, Jen? <laughs> it's... <laughs> Kelly. It's the same word that's used in Proverbs, thank you, Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 4, or Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 30, where it says, a sound heart is the life of the flesh. A sound heart. It's the same Hebrew word, marpe. Healed. Healed. See, guys, we have it under our authority. Amen? We need to be declaring what God says. It's not just praying in the Spirit. That's a big part of it. It is that, but it's, it's just declaring and praising. Why do you think praise is so powerful? One more. Acts 16, verse 13. Watch this one. Watch this one. Acts chapter 16, verse 13. Most of you know this story. And on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made, and we sat down and spake unto the woman which resorted thither. Next verse. And a certain woman named Lydia was seller of purple. Is this what I want? Keep going. No, 1616. 16. Next, that's what I want, I think. We'll get it. Yeah, it is. Thank you. And it came to pass as we went to prayer. You know, the enemy don't want you praying. That's why all these foolish people that think they're under grace and say, well, we don't pray. We become a prayer. No, you've became an idiot. <laughs> an idiot. Seriously. That's idiocy. God gets in through your prayers. Amen. He can't get in throughout, without your prayers. Notice, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. Next verse. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. Leave that up there. In the Greek, it's not the way of salvation. There's no definite article in the Greek. What she was saying, these men show unto us a way of salvation. There's no indefinite article in the Greek, there, but there's no definite article here. So what it's saying, this lady was saying, hey, we're talking about Jesus, right? But see, but it was saying, we're showing you, Jesus is not a way. He is the way. Amen. The only way. Amen. Amen? Now, next verse. And this she did many days. I want you to notice something. Paul didn't make a rash judgment. You see that? This she did many days, but Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. Now, notice that he said it to the Spirit. He didn't pray to God to get rid of it. He spoke directly to the Spirit and commanded it to come out. And notice it came out the same hour. We don't know. if It doesn't sound like it was instant. It said it was within that hour. When you release the life of Christ, things happen. But what I want you to notice is Paul didn't make a rash decision. But Paul made a judgment call. But notice that the Spirit came, that the attack came when they went to prayer. Satan hates prayer. He hates it. Because if you recognize the authority you have, God can't get in because he likes you. He loves you. He can only get in through your prayers. Amen. So when you go to prayer, there's going to be things that are going to come against and try to... Listen, we're to pray without ceasing. I get it. God never leaves us nor forsakes us. But it's also good to come together and pray too. They went to prayer. Ooh, glory to God. There's so much fire in the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Now next week, because I didn't get to it today, I want to get to Matthew chapter 7. Do you know you can stop the grace of God in your life? We're going to get into judging other people. Are we supposed to judge other people? Now, I'm not talking about sending them to hell. That's not what we're talking about. But are we supposed to discern? Yes. Guy's coming up to you and he says, Hey, man, I love you. And he's pulling a knife out of his other pocket to stab you. I'm not going to judge. <laughs> you better judge. <laughs> right? Quickly, yes. But see, because of this, Christian, we don't, people don't even know the difference between love and tolerance. Love and tolerance are not the same thing, guys. Hallelujah. You're blessed. So we judge ourselves first, right? Make sure we're in line with what Jesus did. We're looking at what Jesus did, not our performance. But then there's a righteous judgment. And I want to get into Matthew chapter 7. And I want to talk about how you can judge your judgment when it comes to
people you're dealing with. Amen. You need to judge your judgment. Because you can stop the grace of God with the wrong judgment. That's what Jesus said. He said the measure of judgment you used on other people is the same measure. A lot of people say, well, grace isn't working in this area. It's because you've judged somebody in that area and you've stopped the grace of God in that area. I'm going to show it to you. If I use a measure and say, Phew. <laughs> you guys believed in healing and were as great as me, well, just wait till I have to deal with something. And I can stop the grace of God by judging you with the wrong measure. You know that. It's very important how, we, how, how I deal with you. You're precious to God. And there's systems. See, God's, God's not saying, I ah, bless God, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to get you because of this. I like what Andrew said on our, our teaching the other night. He said, he said, if you grab an electric wire and you're grounded, that law works. It's not personal. <laughs> <laughs> like how the electric company saying, I got you. I've been waiting on this. It's not personal. But we need to understand these things. Things in the spirit are governed by laws or standards. They are. Amen. You're blessed. If anybody here is not born again,